Brontosaurus, which means Thunder Lizard. Very cool name. Is a genus of herbivorous sauropod dinosaurs that lived in what is now the United States during the late Jurassic period. It was first described by Othniel Charles Marsh in 1879, and the type species was dubbed Brontosaurus excelsus, because man, Marsh was on point with naming this thing. It was based on a partial skeleton that lacked a skull found in Como Bluff, Wyoming. They would have lived about 156 to 146 million years ago, with the remains being found in the Morrison Formation of what is now Utah and Wyoming. Or did they? Hmm. See, here's the thing about Brontosaurus. It, it might not be a thing, exactly. It might just be a Patasaurus. Which, first of all, they are definitely close relatives at the bare minimum. But for many years, it was thought that these two were actually just synonyms of each other. It wasn't until very recently that a new study suggested that they should be separate again. And, 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 then, the mainstream news media jumped on it saying how, Oh my god, Brontosaurus is back! You guys, Brontosaurus is back from the dead! It's been resurrected! Brontosaurus is now a thing you can say 100% even if that's not actually what happened in any way. And the study that determined this, while very thorough, is still hotly contested even now. The news media, again, jumped the gun on it, and now everyone's even more confused if they weren't completely confused about this dinosaur already. Because even though Brontosaurus for many years wasn't considered a thing, everyone still said Brontosaurus instead of Apatosaurus. It's a much more famous name, up there with the likes of Tyrannosaurus Rex and Triceratops, and Stegosaurus for that matter. But unlike the other three, Brontosaurus was not a thing for a long time, and even now it's still debated as to whether or not it should be a thing, or whether or not it's all just a Patasaurus. Also, to make it even more confusing, some stories suggest that the reason why Brontosaurus was named as such and why it was thought to be a thing while not actually being a thing is because of an issue with the skull. Namely, they put the wrong skull on a skeleton at one point. In fact, it happened more than once. Also, that skull issue had nothing to do with the naming issue. Just so we're clear, there's a lot to unpack with Brontosaurus. But that's, that's, that's try to get it straight for the rest of you so you all know at least reasonably, what's going on here. The first discovery of the original holotype specimen, again, was by Othniel Charles Marsh in 1879. This specimen was taken from the Morrison Formation at Kama Bluff, Wyoming, by a fossil collector named William Harlow Reed. It was identified as being from an entirely new genus, and therefore new species, which would wind up being named Brontosaurus excelsus, and at the time, the Morrison Formation was the center of the Bone Wars, which I did an entire video about. Due to the rivalry between Marsh and Cope, both were in a rush to name as many different new species of dinosaur as possible. Therefore, when Marsh got a hold of this particular specimen, he examined it, but in a very chaotic manner, and just said, Yes, absolutely, this is brand new, 100%, I know it. Brontosaurus excelsus, bam! And it was an impressive find, as it was one of the most complete sauropod skeletons that was known at that time, as it contained many of the characteristic, but very fragile, cervical vertebrae, which would normally be lost through the passage of time. Marsh, at that point, thought that Brontosaurus should be a member of the Atlantosauridae, which was a clade of sauropod dinosaurs he had named in 1877 that also included Atlantosaurus, which is a dubious genus, just so we're clear, as well as Apatosaurus, not a dubious genus. It's also probably worth mentioning, to add to the confusion, that when Marsh said Atlantosauridae, he'd actually be referring to the Diplodocidae. And just a year after the initial find in 1880, another partial postcranial brontosaurus skeleton was collected by Reed, which included well-preserved limb elements. Marsh would again name this as a new species, Brontosaurus amplus. However, that is now considered a complete synonym with Excelsus. It's the same thing, he was just naming another species to get one up on Cope again. In August of 1883, 
Marshall P. Felch would collect a disarticulated partial skull, known as USNM V5730, that belonged to a sauropod further south in the Felch Quarry at Garden Park, Colorado, and he would send this specimen to Yale. Marsh decided to refer this skull to B. Excelsis, since it was missing that, and he later featured it in a skeletal reconstruction of the tight specimen in 1891. The same illustration would be featured again in his publication, The Dinosaurs of North America, in 1896. At the Yale Peabody Museum, the skeleton of Brontosaurus Excelsus would later be mounted in 1931 with a skull that was based on the Marsh Reconstruction. And at that time, most museums were actually using skulls that were cast from Camarasauruses, for pretty much every other sauropod that didn't have skulls, which is wrong, don't, don't do that. However, the Peabody Museum decided to sculpt a completely different skull that was based on Marsh's recon, which was also wrong, for many reasons. His interpretation included forward-pointing nasals, which was different from pretty much any other dinosaur in general, as well as fenestrae differing from the drawing and other skulls. The mandible was also based on a Camarasaurus, and the skull issue would continue to be a frequent theme involving the history of this animal. During a Carnegie Museum expedition to Wyoming in 1901, William Harlow Reed collected yet another brontosaurus skeleton, a partial postcranial skeleton of a young juvenile, known as CM-566, and it included partial limbs, but this individual was found intermingled with another fairly complete skeleton of an adult specimen, UW-15556. That adult skeleton was actually very well preserved, and had many cervical and caudal vertebrae still intact. In fact, it is the most complete definite specimen of the species. The skeletons would be granted a new genus and species, Elosaurus parvus, by Olaf A. Peterson and Charles Gilmore in 1902. But, um, that's... that's not a thing! Again! Both of the specimens came from the Morrison Formation, and the species would be later transferred under Apatosaurus by several different authors. And while the skull and the misidentification of remains kept going on, a paleontologist named Elmer Riggs, in the 1903 edition of Geological Series of the Field Columbian Museum, argued that Brontosaurus wasn't actually different enough from Apatosaurus to even warrant a separate genus at all. They were very similar, so he decided to create a new combination, Apatosaurus excelsus, for it specifically. Riggs explained that, in view of these facts, the two genera may be regarded as synonymous. As the term Apatosaurus has priority, Brontosaurus will be regarded as a synonym. That is following the rules. Apatosaurus had been named first, so it should, in theory, take over if it was decided that they actually referred to the same animal. But despite this, before the mounting of the American Museum of Natural History specimen, Henry Fairfield Osborne, another paleontologist, decided to label it Brontosaurus anyway. In 1905, they would unveil that specimen, which was at the time the first ever mounted skeleton of a sauropod. It was a composite specimen, and they referred to it as Brontosaurus excelsus. The original specimen was very complete, only missing the feet, and the tail was fashioned to appear as Marsh had believed it should, which meant that it had too few vertebrae. They also didn't have the skull, which meant that they had to fashion a skull based on what they thought it should look like. The result was not a delicate skull like that of Diplodocus, which is what Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus, whatever you want to call them, should logically have. No, this particular skull was based on the biggest, thickest, strongest skull bones, lower jaw, and tooth crowns from three different quarries. All of these probably came from Camarasaurus, again, which to be fair was the only other sauropod of which good skull material was known at the time. And Osborne, to his credit, did note in a publication that the skull was largely conjectural. In 1909, an Apatosaurus skull was found, however, during the first expedition to what would become known as the Carnegie Quarry at the Dinosaur National Monument, which was led by Earl Douglas. That skull was found a few meters away from another skeleton, identified as a new species, Apatosaurus luise. The skull itself was designated CM-11162, and was noted to be very similar to Diplodocus skulls. 
It was accepted as belonging to Apatosaurus by Douglas, as well as the then Carnegie Museum director, William J. Holland. But other scientists, including Osborne, rejected it, not believing the skull could be that small. Holland defended his view in 1914 in an address to the Paleontological Society of America, but he left the mount at Carnegie Museum headless, and it's unknown exactly why he chose to do that. Some thought he was trying to avoid fighting with Osborne, but others thought that he was perhaps just waiting until an articulated skull and neck were found that would definitely confirm the association between the skull and skeleton. But Holland would die in 1934 before such a thing could be found, and, yet again, a cast of a Camarasaurus skull was placed on the mount by museum staff. In fact, no actual skulls that could be referred to Apatosaurus or Brontosaurus is mentioned in the literature until the 1970s, when John Stanton McIntosh and David Berman re-described the skulls of Diplodocus and Apatosaurus. They believed that Holland was likely correct, even though he never published his opinion, and that Apatosaurus should have a more Diplodocus-like skull. According to them, many skulls long thought to belong to Diplodocus might instead be those of Apatosaurus. They wound up reassigning multiple skulls to that genus based on associated and closely associated vertebrae. And on October 20th, 1979, the first skull, actual skull of an Apatosaurus, was finally mounted on a skeleton in a museum, specifically the Carnegie Museum. In 1995, the American Museum of Natural History would also follow this and unveil their own remounted skeleton, which was now labeled not as Brontosaurus, but as Apatosaurus excelsus, with a corrected tail and a new skull that was cast from Apatosaurus Luise. In 1998, Robert T. Baker referred a skull and mandible of an Apatosaurine from Como Bluff to Brontosaurus excelsus, though the skull is still to this date undescribed. In 2011, the first specimen of Apatosaurus where a skull was found articulated with its cervical vertebrae was finally described, known as CMC VP7180. Though it did differ in both skull and neck features from A. Luisa, so it's believed that this specimen was actually Apatosaurus Ajax, but it's still same genus. But you might be saying at this point, what does the skull have to do with the name issue? Well, nothing. Not a thing. Not a single solitary thing about the skull issue has to do with the name issue. Even though I have read more than one article saying that that's exactly why they were confused. No. No. It had nothing to do with that. The name issue was thought to be solved years ago. Remember, during this explanation, I mentioned that Riggs had argued that the Brontosaurus was not different enough from Apatosaurus to warrant a separate genus. Well, here's the thing about that. While some argued with him, and certain museums labeled the animals as Brontosaurus, almost all 20th century paleontologists actually agreed with Riggs, and therefore the proper name of the genus should be Apatosaurus as it was published first. So Brontosaurus was considered a junior synonym and discarded from formal use, and it remained that way for many years. The issue was that Brontosaurus, for whatever reason, partially because of the museums and partially because of fictional media, resonated much better with the general public, to the point that even educational books use the word Brontosaurus to describe the genus when, in fact, properly it should be Apatosaurus. For years it frustrated paleontologists, but Baker, once again, had actually argued in the 90s that Apatosaurus Ajax and Apatosaurus Excelsus were actually sufficiently distinct to the point that it could merit a separate genus. This line of thinking would lead to a 2015 study which was very extensive, carried out by Emmanuel Tshop, Octavio Mateus, and Roger Benson. They would conclude that Brontosaurus was indeed a valid genus of sauropod that was distinct enough from Apatosaurus to be that. While they acknowledged that the animals were obviously closely related, they weren't so much that they were under the same genus. They would conclude that it could be resurrected as a valid name, and they would assign two former Apatosaurus species. A. Parvis and A. Ganapin to Brontosaurus instead, as well as the original type species Brontosaurus excelsus. 
And like I mentioned, the mainstream news media went wild with this because Brontosaurus is so famous. Brontosaurus is back! Brontosaurus resurrected, etc, etc, you know, the whole spiel, clickbait nonsense, and... But the problem is that this is one paper from three dudes, and not everyone agrees on it. The publication did meet with plenty of criticism from other paleontologists, including Michael DeEmick and Donald Plethero, who, like I just did, criticized the mass media's reaction, as he felt it was superficial and premature. He is... he is correct. In fact, some paleontologists, like John and Rebecca Foster, to this day continue to consider Brontosaurus a synonym of a patasaurus. Some have even argued that the paper was brought about because of sentimental reasons, because Brontosaurus has resonated with people and the general public so thoroughly, even if it's not scientifically accurate. And I've even had people in the comments, when they requested I talk about this, say, hey, can you talk about how Brontosaurus is back? No, I can't talk about that, because it's still debated. The thing about paleontology, in, in any field of science, but especially paleontology, is that not everyone agrees on some things, and it's really hard to find concrete evidence for something that's so old. You can debate and argue all you want, but until proof is found, it's hard to say one way or the other. In this instance, the verdict's still out as to whether or not Brontosaurus will be a solid 100% forever genus of its own or perhaps simply a junior synonym of a patasaurus like it was for so long. As far as what I think, well, I'm not sure that matters much. My rule is always, I just want the truth. And I actually spent many years training myself out of saying brontosaurus and saying a patasaurus. So, admittedly, the notion that I might have to go back to saying brontosaurus is a little frustrating. But I guess the real question here is, what do you guys think? Do you think brontosaurus is honestly its separate genus? Or do you think that they're jumping the gun here? I mean, I know the media is, but what about the scientists? Because it was scientists who published the paper. Do you think they're right? Is it separate? Or are they all just a patasaurus? Let me know in the comments below. And with that, a special thank you to my Apex Predators, Arthur Roy, Metal for Life Guy, and Dr. Racer78. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.